Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Stoked to have you on. Where in the world can we find you today? Uh, I'm currently in Manhattan. But a LA native, the land of milk and honey, we miss you here. I, uh, I hope we, we can catch up in the real world. We're going to talk about a lot of fun stuff today. So let's start with the really depressing stuff out of the way first. What's the status of savings in the U.S. for Americans? Uh, give us the broad overview. It's not a pretty picture, is it? Yeah, it hasn't been a pretty picture for a long time. I mean, I think it's more top of mind now than ever, given, given COVID, that bad things can happen pretty quickly and that people need to think about you know, saving more and being more financially robust in the future. Uh, but you know, we're still in a position where almost half of Americans can't come up with $400 in an emergency and 78% of people live paycheck to paycheck. Um, the personal savings rate hit an all-time high in May, uh, so people are saving more as a percentage of their income. A lot of that was driven by you know, stimulus checks and things like that, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes from here. But um, hopefully, hopefully disaster makes people think more about saving going forward. Yeah, as we think about, you know, we just we did a recent podcast with Joel Greenblatt. Listeners, if you haven't heard it, check it out. Where um, it's talking about a lot of policy ideas for all sorts of different uh, parts of of finance investing, but particularly the wealth and income gap. What what are sort of the core issues? Are Americans just crappy at savings? Do they not make enough money? Uh, do they just love playing? Uh, um, uh, the sports betting on the weekend? Like what's, what's the main issue here? I think it's a combination of, of all the things you mentioned. Um, but one thing that we're especially focused on is let's, let's separate some people. They don't make enough money to really set enough aside for saving for a rainy day. At the same time, there are statistics out there that show that Americans spend 80 to $90 billion per year on the lottery. Um, and that comes out to about 640 to 700 dollars per household. And so the reality is that a lot of Americans are finding room in their budget to buy things like lottery tickets, which I'm not here to say it's an irrational decision from a emotional perspective and other perspectives, but from a purely financial perspective, the lottery is pretty much the worst gamble you can possibly make. And so there's a lot of overlap between the group I mentioned before, half of Americans, you know, not being able to come up with $400 in an emergency and people spending over $650 per year on the lotteries. If those same people just saved that money instead of spent on the lottery, they would have that money in the bank potentially. Um, so there is an issue with human behavior as well. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing about the lottery is you think about it, um, you know, that's the average American. And if you look at, the people that are active lottery players, it's like double or triple that they spend like, a, I forget that exact number, but it's like a thousand or 2000 or $3,000 yep. a year. And, you know, I've said this on Twitter before years ago, I said, you know, theoretically, if you're a politician, that that's an incredibly predatory and you say, look, free will, yada, yada, whatever. But still, it's a predatory system that's set up why won't any politicians, congressmen, senators of the like say, no, no, we're going to do away with this. Well, it's because it generates a ton of revenue. <laughs> so we all know yeah. politicians will be politicians. And last thing you want is take away their, uh, their piggy bank. And so it's this weird conflicting system that everyone knows is terrible for people. Uh, but part of it is, you know, that people want to fantasize about a, a, a brighter future and they feel like they're, uh, there's no out. And so we, anyway, we talk a lot about systems and incentives and structures, which uh, leads right into kind of what you guys are up to. Any other thoughts on the broad issues yeah. and um, before we jump into what y'all are, y'all are doing? Yeah, not only is the lottery a weird thing for the government to be running and supporting because it doesn't really help people, it actually hurts a lot of people, but it makes it even worse that the government has a monopoly on it. If you had a lot, if you had legal lotteries and you were in private enterprise was allowed to run lotteries, at least the expected value for people who played the lottery would be much more, you know, it would be much higher. It would be more competitive. Instead, you've got a monopoly on a system that you, if you play blackjack in Vegas, you have much, much, much better return on your investment, if you want to call it that, than you do playing the monopolized lottery. So not only should it 
is it crazy that the government runs it, but it's crazy that the government monopolizes it. Good news is you guys have started thinking about uh, something we've actually talked a lot about on this podcast or Twitter in the past um, before y'all existed. Uh, and this isn't something new. This goes back, I think, a couple hundred years, right? Talk to me a little bit about the origin story uh, for Yada and what you guys uh, led you to uh, starting the company. So in the UK, there's something called premium bonds, which a lot of Americans, almost every American probably hasn't heard of, but most people who've lived in the UK are familiar with. And it's basically a system there that's run by the government where people save money. Um, and instead of getting paid interest, like you typically would in a savings account, you get the chance to win a prize every month. And the prizes range from 25 pounds to 1 million pounds as the jackpot. And basically for every pound you put into the system, you get one entry to win a prize. This has been around in this form in the UK since the mid fifties or sixties, I forget exactly the date, but over time it's become the number one savings vehicle there. So over a third of the British population participates in it. And there's over a hundred billion dollars in savings in this system. And so it's been hugely popular in the UK. It actually, it wasn't premium bonds, but this type of savings account called a prize linked savings account or a lottery linked savings account really dates back hundreds of years. Um, and even in the last, call it 30, 40 years, not only in the UK has it been massive, but in New Zealand and South Africa and a bunch of other countries, but it's a relatively new thing to the US. So um, were you just over in a pub in, uh, in London, chat with some friends and, and bought some premium bonds? What, uh, what originally was the spark that, uh, that got you to start Yada? I wish I could say that was the story, but, but it's not. Um, it's a little bit more boring than that. A friend of mine had moved to the UK, a good friend of mine, and he knows I'm a geek about behavioral psychology, personal finance, all that kind of stuff. And he came across the program and told me about it. And I was just fascinated by it. I mean, I, I knew a little bit about the statistics in the US about paycheck to paycheck and people not having money for an emergency and the lottery statistics we talked about. And this idea just really struck a chord with me given my interest in behavioral psych. And so I started doing a lot of research into the space. I was wondering why I'd never heard about it before. Ultimately looked into why it's not a thing in the US, uh, what, what's the state of this industry in the US. And ultimately I just got really excited about the idea to bring it here um, in a way that could be as similarly massively successful as it's been in other countries. All right. And then unlike many people who would just say, okay, that sounds interesting. Somebody should do that. What was the, what was the uh, roadmap? Start with Y Combinator or before? This was before Y Combinator. So this was about a year ago. Um, the first step was, was researching the space in the U.S., trying to figure out if there was an opportunity here. Um, we can get into this more, but it was generally uh, an illegal concept in the U.S. until 2015. So it really wasn't possible until recently. Uh, there's a few players that have tried to play in the space, and we just thought they weren't executing very well based on talking to their users and figuring out what they liked and didn't like. Um, and so initially, after doing that work, it was really designing the concept and mocking it up. Uh, I ended up working with a team of freelance developers for a couple months. Um, my technical co-founder that joined as well um, a couple months after that. And then we brought all the development in-house. Really started building it in January, launching it uh, this past summer. And that's when we run Y Combinator uh, for the summer. And yeah, since our launch, we've been growing very quickly. And Things are, things are going well so far. Wow, that was quick. Okay, um, tell us a little bit about the Y Combinator experience. I know a lot of listeners are uh, budding founders as well as investors. Uh, how was uh, the experience for you guys? What was the whole application process like? Any fun stories that came out of that? It, we're really glad we did it. So the application process, we did it kind of on a whim. It takes, you fill out an application online, you answer a, a list of questions, even if you don't end up applying or even if you don't get into the program, going through the process of filling out the application really helps you um, get your head around your own idea and test your core assumptions and things like that. So I think it's a worthwhile exercise regardless. 
but so then we submitted the application. We got an email back a few weeks later that we that we got scheduled for an interview. And then we had the interview, I think, the last day of April, first day of May, something like that. And it was a quick 10-minute interview with three partners. Then they brought us back in a few hours later for a second round of interviews. Um, and then that night, they told us we got in. And we spent the weekend deciding whether we, we were going to do it or not. Ultimately, we decided to do it. And we're glad we did. Um, part of the decision making was around this was the very first Y Combinator remote batch. So we were trying to figure out, is this going to be as valuable as it has mm. been in the past? Ultimately, it was. And it, it being a remote experience, you still get all the advice you get from the partners who are working with you. You still get the camaraderie around other founders and pushing each other to move faster and setting goals and things like that. And you do build the network. I'm sure the network would have been stronger if we were in person because um, it's just tougher to build relationships virtually but what's the output once you guys are done it's uh they give you some they give you some cash they take an ownership stake how's how's that work so once you start you get they give you basically 100 now it's 125,000 they gave 150,000 we were the last batch to get that investment they take a piece of equity that happens before the batch during the batch every week you have uh speakers that you know inspiring speakers in the past who have gone through YC and have been successful. Um, you have a group that you talk to every week for an hour about challenges and things like that. And these are companies going through very similar problems that you're facing. And so it's a lot of very applicable challenges that you learn from each other from. Um, and we have our group partners who are YC partners who have you know, seen startups probably more than anyone in the world. So they have, they have tons of repetitions of what people have done correctly in the past or where people have gone wrong in the past and that's super valuable and then at the end of the day the last day there's a, there's a demo day where we present for hundreds of investors this was on a video chat usually it's in person and we ended up raising a seed round out of that a lot of companies do but you don't necessarily have to raise money out of it but for us it, it just made sense timing wise where we were, where we were with the company and you know, demo day is really helpful because it gets a lot of investors in front of you at one time. We've, we've danced around it enough at this point. Let's hear what Yada actually is, what you guys actually do. Tell us about uh, the company. Yada is a savings account where instead of earning interest like you would in a traditional bank, you are in the chance to win prizes on a weekly basis. So for every $25 you save, instead of, say, getting 1% interest like you might at a different bank, you get one ticket every week. So let's say you save $100, you get four tickets. You get those tickets every single week. Each ticket you pick numbers on. And basically every week there's winning numbers that we select, similar to a lottery, It's not a lottery, it's a sweepstakes. And the more numbers you match, the more, the more you can win. And the prizes range from 10 cents all the way to a jackpot of $10 million. Um, oh, damn, anybody won that yet? What's been the biggest payout? Not yet. You might win it soon, though. I think if you keep, you got to keep depositing more, and maybe, maybe it'll be you. But um, <laughs> the biggest payout so far has been five thousand. Awesome. I uh, Adam is is referencing before this episode. Uh, I signed up for an account, put in a hundred bucks. Took me about five minutes. Got uh, got some tickets. On top of that, you guys can use my code Meb. You can give me some more tickets if you sign up. Here's the cool thing. Here's the problem. I was smiling or crying inside, I'm not sure which, when you were referencing 1% savings because I have a Bank of America account. Not only that, I am super secret preferred rewards member or whatever it was. And in prep for this interview, I looked up my interest rate on my super rewards Bank of America. And it is, any guesses by the way? You probably know this. Uh, three basis points. Five, five, five basis wow. points. Listeners who aren't familiar with basis point, it is 0.05%. Um, and I remember getting an email, by the way, in the last year that was, it was like a, you know, a form marketing email where they were championing, championing the uh, big news about how uh, I'm a preferred customer that gives me, it went from like three to five exactly what you're talking about. I'm like, this is so offensive. I don't even know what to say. 
Uh, I had to like search through the site, download a PDF. Anyway, so essentially you're getting nothing already at Bank of America. Um, talk to me about uh, kind of how it works with you guys. Is it, are these insured accounts? Um, you know, is how, how does it kind of work on on your end for practical uh, concepts? We part, so we are not a bank, we partner with the bank. So any deposit made into a Yada account, the funds are held at an FDIC insured partner bank. So the same way your funds are FDIC insured at Bank of America, up to $250,000, it's the same exact thing. Um, the reason Bank of America can get away with paying you the five basis points and the reason they make it so hard to find what that rate is, is because of, they take advantage of inertia. People sign up for a bank account when they, you know, turn 18 and they just kind of, they go with it. They keep, they keep with it for 20 years. They don't switch. They like the convenience these, these big brick and mortar banks offer of branches, which I think is less important these days, but historically it's probably been useful for people. Um, and they can just get away with it. I mean, this is like, this is an expense for them. They're taking your money and they're lending it out and earning uh, three to 5% margin on that, on, on those dollars. And the less they can pay their depositors, the more they make as a company. And if people are willing to put money into their accounts and, you know, I guess similar to you or other, a lot of people, I mean, the big banks have most of the deposits in the country. Um, they just make that extra profit. And so there are a lot of other options. Uh, generally, these are online banks or banks that don't have a, as big a brick and mortar presence which allows them to have lower expenses. You don't see them sponsoring sports stadiums. You don't see them advertising on TV. You don't see them having a, a physical branch in Times Square, Fifth Avenue um, in New York. And so they pass on a lot of this value to you in terms of a higher interest rate. And the reason they do it is because they're, that's how they're getting customers. They're not getting customers because they have the brick and mortar presence. And so Basically, there's a huge pool of money in this country sitting in these no interest or almost no interest savings accounts. But the problem is, again, it's inertia. People, they're not really motivated to, to open a new account and deal with the hassle. And I can get into reasons why, but that's- Yeah, uh, that's why? Tell, dude, I, this is almost turning into a psychology session because yeah. I have my money there and I haven't moved it. And um, you know, this also applies to all facets of finance and investing. We preach all the time on this show about uh, people being stuck in these legacy 1%, 2% uh, fee mutual funds that aren't even trying to be active. These are just like straight up index funds uh, that don't do anything that are tax inefficient, but people have been there and they said, you know, the world advances by uh, death and, and divorces and no one ever really goes back. But yeah, I, I, the inertia seems like such a big one, but let's, I, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts. Go ahead, go ahead and expand on it. It's, it's especially a problem for lower to moderate income Americans, I think. So if you make, if you make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, a lot of people see the, okay, I can earn 1% extra by opening an online savings account. Oh, that could add up to, a th to hundreds or thousands of dollars over a year or over multiple years. But let's say you're one of these, you're someone who spends $600 on the lottery. You could be saving $600 in your Bank of America account, which is what you have right now. You're earning basically zero on that. Um, if you're, a, part of it is an awareness problem. A lot of people don't know these other options exist. And there's no minimums most of the time. It's, it's a pretty easy process to sign up, takes five minutes. But let's say there's this overhead mentally of opening a new account. You open a new online account, and let's say you earn 1%. Okay, now instead of zero, you're getting $6. And so for a lot of people, is that $6 worth the overhead and hassle of managing two separate accounts? Probably not. And I'm oversimplifying it, but isn't a lot more fun instead of getting an extra $6 a year to maybe buy some lottery tickets and maybe it's oh it's two dollars a day it's not that much right but over time two dollars a day for that ticket adds up and if you save that money instead yeah you might only be getting six dollars this year but you also have the six hundred dollars in your savings account and if you do it consistently over ten years you'll have six or seven thousand dollars saved up fundamentally what we're trying to do is make it so people will migrate towards high yield savings accounts in the low to moderate income demographic, especially by saying, you're not only going to get $6 of 
on average, let's say 1% value from us, but you're going to have fun every week. You're going to have the same thrill that the lottery provides of this $10 million jackpot, a life changing amount of money. And even if you never win a prize, even if, which is unlikely, if you never win anything, you still have the, those funds in, in your bank account. Talk about the prizes. I, I'm assuming um, you said no one has hit the biggie yet, but on, on average, like in any given week, are people actually winning? Is it rare for people to win? Um, what percentage yeah. of people? All that good stuff. So right now on any given week, if you only have one ticket, you have a two to three percent chance of winning something. Hmm. The most common prize is going to be the smaller prizes, obviously. Right now, the 10 cent prize is the most common, the smallest one. Um, but you could win up to be a thousand dollar prize, the five thousand dollar prize. Uh, we have ten dollar prizes, fifteen dollar prizes. It's really the more you match, the more you win. And I, I don't know off head the exact percentages of those, but let's say you put a hundred dollars away, you have four tickets, and any given week you have about an eight percent chance to win something. Um, and so even if you don't win the big one, you still got the excitement from it. And you still got the, 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 what helped you motivate you to save in the first place. You know, here's why I like the idea. And, and for listeners, um, I'm, I'm not only a client, I'm also a very small investor in the company. Um, but this concept that we've been talking about for a long time, it checks the boxes in my mind. Um, it does the first part of being sort of, um, you know, in this finance world of do no harm. I mean, the lottery to me, I don't know what the net net present value on every lottery ticket is, what they're chipping off. And maybe, you know, if it's five, ten, five, ten percent, fifty percent. And some of them, it's got to be scratchers. I, I love the scratchers when I was a kid. I think it's I don't know the scratchers specifically, but it's north. The expected value is north of losing 50 percent. Oh, God, that's horrific. So I that was my prize for learning to ride a bike when I was a kid, as my dad said, he'd buy me a scratcher. And I, I definitely T-boned a bunch of telephone poles on my way to hey, doing that. But at least, you, at least you learned how to ride a bike as a kid. <laughs> I learned as a, as a 21-year-old from a friend of mine. So That sounds painful. My dad's not uh, going to be happy if he listens to this podcast because he claims he taught me. But that's, that's a, funny. It's, it's a debate. But. Uh, a lot of cars in L.A. It's tougher to learn here, you know. Um, I was easy. I was in Colorado. <laughs> All right. So, so if, A, it checks the box of do no harm. Um, B is it creates this nice funnel of incentives, you know, where your brain, that the little part that lights up when you win something, you know, it keeps people engaged and interested. And, and this is why I love this. And this is why it works. Like it very clearly works in places like UK. There's another country that's really popular. Um, and there was yeah. a, and you can correct me where New Zealand and South New Africa Zealand. are the ones that have, public data available that really show how popular they became. There's also a slew of other countries that, that have these yeah. programs, but there's no, there's no real data available. But I, I could easily see politicians listening to this podcast and other policymakers scratch their head and, and think, why aren't we doing more of this? This seems so much more beneficial to our constituents than something like um, the, the traditional lottery. Isn't there, what was, the, what was the state that first legalized this? Do you remember? Was it Illinois before it was federal? Um, so the state right. that, there was, a, it's a little more nuanced, but there was a legal loophole in Michigan okay. that allowed That's credit unions to offer this product um, even before the 2015 change in legislation. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of it kind of went under the rug. There wasn't a lot of people when I would talk about it on Twitter and elsewhere that really were either a familiar or ever heard of this idea or or, or b aware of the legislation. All right, so you guys launched the app is awesome. Uh, by the way, any uh, any are you cheering for the prize to pay out or is this kind of like are, are you, is that going to be a dark yeah. day for you? No, that so the way the prizes work is the jackpot prize we are able to offer because we partner with an insurance company. So we are basically paying the insurance company a premium no matter what. Uh, so if someone wins, it's not Yada paying the prize, it's the insurance company paying the prize. And this also helps with um, trust with our users. So we, a lot of users are like, oh, you're, you're rigging the numbers, things like that. The reality is we have a double blind system with the insurance company, but we want, we want someone to win. Like we, we want someone to win. It would be good for us. We have no control over it because of the way the, the system works on the back end where 
again, we pick the insurance company picks the winning numbers. We don't, and the insurance company has no access to the user's picks. But if someone wins, that would be great publicity for us. And um, so that would be that would be wonderful. Um, I was I was thinking about this as you were talking about it because Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett, for the listeners, uh, investment peeps on the show, uh, you know, does a lot of this, not cat bond, but sort of insurance for these pretty rare events like lottery style events. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he would like to partner with you guys. He, he would probably love this idea, savings. Um, all right, so you launched, the app's awesome. You can sign up, it's so clean and simple. What's the rest of the year, 2021, 2022 look like? Are the big focus just acquiring customers? How do you get the word out? Uh, what's, uh, what's the future look like? Yeah, a lot of it's focused on acquiring customers. And then the other, I guess, half of it is focused on building a better uh, product uh, from both a app fun standpoint, but also becoming more of a complete bank offering, whereas right now it's this very simple limited savings account. And so for a long time, um, there was just me and my co-founder on the team. We've been growing the team, uh, hiring in the engineering and marketing uh, departments primarily. And so the focus over the next six months on the product side is adding things like a checking account in addition to a savings account and a way to spend from the account, a debit card. Uh, things like allowing users to open joint accounts, allowing users to designate a beneficiary on the account. So there's a lot of these basic banking services that, we, that our users are asking for and that we need to have in order to be a place where people want to put more of their money and do more of their banking from. So that's kind of one side of the, the coin, I guess. It's on the marketing side, um, we have been, so our growth has been primarily driven by referrals. So if anyone refers a friend, they each get 100 tickets into the next week's drawing. And that's really, that's really driven almost all of our growth so far. Um, we are now focused on other channels and exploring how else can we acquire users cost effectively. Um, so we're gonna be experimenting with lots of different things. One thing that's worked really well for us so far, in addition to referrals, has been partnering with influencers, especially YouTube. So if you look us up on YouTube, there are a lot of videos about us and a lot of people signing up through those referral codes. Um, and so doubling down on the influencer strategy and looking into other channels in addition to accelerating referrals. Well, good listeners. Let's see if we can beat all those YouTube uh, influencers with the code MEB. Uh, I was at one point when Betterment rolled out their new checking feature, I was their number one referral and I don't get anything out of that. So uh, wow. we'll see. We'll see if the, the MEB crew can, can show up in force. Um, you know, it's interesting and this is just brainstorm portion and you can feel free to comment on any of this or not. You know, I, I think um, there's a lot of, in my mind, incentives in the investing world too, uh, you know, and the concept of everyone talks about being an investor and having a long-term time horizon and that they just don't, you know, it, it's just a, it's for the most, it's a fallacy, but the ability to align your investing horizon really with what you say you will, which is usually for most people in terms of decades rather than months, quarters, years, forget about Robin Hood, yeah. uh, hours, minutes, um, that could be an interesting angle for you guys too one day as well. You know, there's Yada savings, Yada investing, where yep. you say, hey, look, you know, you invest a certain amount, um, we'll, uh, we'll be able to, uh, you know, consistently put you in a basket of ETFs or something. Is that something you guys have brainstormed at all? Yeah, we definitely have it on the roadmap. Likely not in the next six to 12 months, but beyond that, it's definitely something we're going to be, be visiting. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit we know we need to we need to get done and things we know we need to do and things we know our users are are asking for in the near term but that's definitely something that we have on our on our minds going forward i mean what what else can we do to help people financially and give them the ability to do all of the things they want to do from one place you know there's a there's an area of and as usual, we're going off track here, but uh, there's an area of investing that still is yet to be disrupted. That's multi-trillion and is full of so much garbage. Uh, it still makes me nauseous, which is the traditional annuity space. And so there is so much fat 
and just nonsense where people get paid these massive commissions. I think the average annuity cost in the U.S. is 2.25%. And wow. um, the actual annuity structure for like a variable annuity, this concept of having essentially like a personal pension, you know, gone are the days yeah. of defined benefit uh, where, you know, my parents' generation, I'm sure yours, went to go work for a company. They're lifers. They got a pension. Work hard. Put your head down. Great. Well, 2020, that's not the case. And so the ability where you have to take control of your own retirement and future, I think, is even more important. So this concept of annuitizing, and in, but investing, so not just you know saving, but also investing it, uh, the cool part from the uh, company perspective, and this is like you mentioned, the inertia and stickiness is you can come up with an equation where the cost of acquisition for the client versus that client's value, because you end up with 10, 20, 30 years of stickiness. There's some companies that have figured out Fisher Investments is a classic one where, you know, they, they're willing to acquire a client for like 10 grand. Uh, and that works out still great. Anyway, I, I don't really have any question. <laughs> this yeah. is just an area that I think is, I want someone to disrupt the annuity space and it's just so uh, calcified. Maybe, maybe uh, we'll get there eventually. Yeah. Put it on the list. Uh, what else are you guys brainstorming? What else are you thinking about? I mean, I imagine how, how big is the team? Everybody remote COVID you guys, yeah, you guys... right now we're still small Four four people. Oh uh, my yeah. God. Incredible. Yeah. We're hoping to, I mean, we're growing quickly. So Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be, I don't know, more than that. So what are you hiring for, by the way? If we got any listeners, is it, is it uh, engineering? Is it marketing? Yep. Yep. Those two buckets. Everything. Yeah. Those two buckets primarily. I guess in, in the near-term roadmap, I got into some of the banking type features we're looking to add. On the, the app itself, one thing that has worked really well for us and has helped us grow so quickly has been creating a very social feeling experience. In the, in the app so people want their friends to join and right now the way we, we, we do it a bunch of ways but we find that so we have this leaderboard in the app where in the week during the week you can see how lucky your friends are this week at the end of the week you can see who the biggest winner was you can so we find a lot of people engage with their friends either offline just texting each other like oh do you have the number things like that so we're trying to make the app as social an experience as possible while preserving, you know, privacy, given some people, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity around finances and privacy. But a, an action people typically do with the lottery is play with friends. They pool tickets together and they can win together and things like that. So one, one of the big features we have coming out, hopefully pretty soon, is the ability to create groups with your friends mm. and share tickets. If you contribute 100 tickets, I contribute 10. If we win, we each win pro rata to the extent we contributed, you know, our, our share of tickets. Um, and so we are focused on helping, helping drive that social experience as much as possible. So hopefully now you want to invite more friends because you want them to join your group and it helps with our growth. And, um, so we're very focused on the social piece. Good. Let me know when we can do the Meb group. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll join and, and get a big, uh, Meb Favor Show podcast group of, of lottery winners. How does the actual drawing work, by the way? You know, I, I grew up going to, uh, bingo in Kansas where they had the old school cage that you would sort of, you know, yeah. roll. Do you guys have a, a Sunday happy hour party where you just I draw n- numbers out of a hat? <laughs> I wish that would be fun. Maybe, maybe one day. Uh, so right now the way it works is we have weekly contests every week. There's seven winning numbers that get revealed. And the way we do it is we drop one number every night at 9 PM Eastern time. Uh, through right now it's uh, just an animation that that happens if you open the app Um, the idea here is to sort of make make it fun over the course of the whole week so maybe it's Thursday three numbers have been released maybe Meb one of your tickets says is three for three so all day you're like oh man you're looking forward to that number and staying alive for the 10 million and maybe you'll talk to people about it so the way we do it is we, we we drip it over the course of the week so you find out how much you won for the entire week on Sundays and on the back end, the, again, the way, the way the drawing actually happens is we work with this third-party insurance company, and they are the ones choosing the numbers. I think so you just need to do a, a, a live stream NBA style. You put all the ping pong balls in a, in a machine and shoot them out. I, 
I wonder if anybody would watch. I imagine they would on the we've, days six uh, and seven if they're getting close. <laughs> yeah, we 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 thought about it. It's a doing some doing some sort of live stream. We thought about it. it's yeah. uh it's on our roadmap. It you know for launch it was a bit of a of a heavier lift, but you look at what like HQ Trivia did if you're familiar with with that app. They created a total you know must see experience at nine p.m. and it really was popular. I think a trivia game lends itself to being more engaging than does a number drawing, but that's not to say we can't figure out how to make it engaging or more engaging than it currently is. And what, what happened to HQ, by the way? They were a hot item for a while. Did they just Phoenix and, and you know, die or, or did they, are they still going? What's the, what's the deal? They're, st they're still around. They shut down for a while and then they got s some extra funding and like re relaunched. Um, one of their founders it... passed away a couple of years ago, like during the, I think while they were still pretty big. So I'm sure that was a tough thing, you know, for the company to go through. And um, I'm not really sure what else happened, but HQ, for HQ to work as a business, it needs to have users check the app every day and be engaged. And so if you're kind of a fad or you are one of these you know, products that's fatty, if all of a sudden people stop engaging because they kind of get tired of it, they kind of lose out from that. For us, we don't really, we don't really need, you don't have to check at 9 p.m. to get value from it, right? Like with HQ, if you didn't check at 9 p.m., you, you can't win anything. You, you, you basically might as well not even use it. With us, you could check the app on a Tuesday, see how much you won, check the next Tuesday. So it's a much more might, might not even know. I just check my account one day and have $10 million in there. You might, you might. That'll be a, that'll be a fun surprise. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, what, uh, what's been the challenge? I mean, you guys are so new. It's, it's so short, but you've been having some pretty astonishing growth. What's, what's been the most challenging moment so far? Has it been the, has it been building it, putting together a team? Has it been COVID? Has it been, uh, what? Yeah, the biggest challenge, I would say for me personally, it's my, it's, I'm a first time founder. It's my first time going through all of the company building processes. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to manage in terms of hiring and investors and all these sort of company things you have to deal with. Um, and just, I would say that's been, that's been challenging, but, you know, it just takes some time to get up to speed on all those things. I think from a, from a company perspective, one of the big challenges we have is as a consumer fintech company where people need to trust you, you know, people are downloading our app and they're linking their external bank account. They're depositing their money. We're, we need to establish trust. And whereas as a new company, it can be tough to get people to trust you. It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem because right when we launch, there's no app reviews, there's no press coverage, there's no... There's none of that stuff. And so who is that first person that's being like, that's saying, oh, I'm going to download Yada. I'm going to Google them. Nothing comes up and I'm still going to trust them enough to, to get started. Um, so solving that trust chicken and egg problem has been challenging. And even now, I mean, we have 2000 reviews in the app store, 4.9 stars. We have press coverage. We have a lot more credibility now than we did four months ago when we launched, but we're still, it's still, every day trying to figure out how can we build more credibility because we do get people who aren't signing up because they're like, Oh, this is a new thing. I don't know if I trust it. Yeah. I was just thinking in my head, you know, it reminded me of the old HQ. Um, as you think about the trust, you know, I mean, so many people in their savings and credit cards and, and elsewhere, uh, you know, there's the lottery aspect, but they also love the rewards. And I was, I was just thinking in my head, I was like, I wonder if you couldn't get some companies to somehow sponsor some of the weekly drawings or do some where it's, you know, they're, Hey, sponsored by, you know, Perrier. And then by the way, if you want to uh, get a free case, of whatever, you know, right. where, where yeah, there's we, also prizes and things too. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we've thought, we've thought about that as well. Yeah. You should join the, the worst, the worst thing, you've got, you've worst thing the, can uh, have, ideas. Yeah. The worst thing that can happen is you come on my show because I just distract you with terrible, 20 horrible ideas and extensions of, of, everyone's company i i uh hey, i have so some far, old so far you're on point you've, you've, <laughs> you've hit on some things that are 
that are on our Trello board. What's been your most memorable investment over, uh, over your lifetime? You got a background in what? Web development, a stint at Goldman, uh, pre-starting yeah. this company. Uh, anything come to mind? Good, bad, in between? Uh, so a non-financial investment, I would say, is I, I left Goldman to learn to code, and that's been tremendously valuable. I, I don't think I'd be able to do what I'm doing right now if I didn't do that or have that sort of background in programming. And how'd you do it? Did you go to school, self-taught? I had taken a few classes in high school, but not enough to really know what I was doing and then didn't do anything for doing any of that for four or five years. And then I did, uh, after I left Goldman, I did Flatiron School, uh, which is, it's an online and an in-person coding bootcamp. Um, I did it in person at the time and it was a 12 week program. So that, that I think was one of my best time investments in terms of developing, developing a skill. Financial investment. Uh, before, before starting Yada, I was very interested in the pet and pet health insurance industry. Mm. And I thought there might be an opportunity to do something in that space. And ultimately didn't, didn't end up doing it myself, but there's a public pet insurance company that I, that I invested in a couple of years ago and it's done pretty well since then. So that's the one that comes yeah. to mind. It's, it's not that exciting of, of a story or anything, but. I say it's somewhat astonishing. I mean, the, I, I think our dog at this point is worth about $50,000 in, in insurance premiums. I consistently asked my wife, I said, why is this so expensive? So clearly, uh, clearly uh, it's a good business model somewhere. I don't know. It seems like a lot of opportunity do, as well. Do you know who your provider is? I don't. I don't. Yeah. I just see it get a, debited out of my no interest earning Bank of America every month somehow. <laughs> so when, when Yada gets set up for payments, you'll, you'll see where it's coming from. Um, Adam, this has been great. Where do people go? They want to find out more about your company, download the app. What, uh, where's, where's the best spot? Yep. So you can go to our website, which is with Yada, Y O T T A.com. Uh, from the website, there are links to download the app, but if you'd like, you can also just search in the player app store for Yada savings. And, uh, that's, that, that's the best place to find us. Awesome. Users, remember code MEB. It takes about five minutes to sign up. You can join me in the groups when, uh, when they roll it out. Adam, thanks so much for joining us today. It was a blast. Thanks for having me, MEB.